The Lord be with you. Good morning, everyone. I am Pastor Miguel, and it's great that you're here this morning worshiping with us. Today is an important day because it's the day of the Lord. So we will continue uh, understanding, reflecting in the paradoxes for life. So as we prepare our hearts and our spirits for this time, I invite you to stand up as you're able so we can sing together. Please join in our unison prayer. Good and gracious God, help us to live your goodness and kindness each day. Remind us that our actions express who we are. We love as you love. Instill with us the wisdom to be good to those who wish us harm to forgive the who need forgiveness and reach out in kindness to all we meet so they can experience your unconditional love through our lives. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Now let us lift up our joys and concerns. Eric Miller offers praise for his good test results. Penny and John offer praise for Iva. Praise and thanks she is home and doing well this time. Amanda Eschenauer lists prayers for uh, Jonathan's teacher. Samantha's boys, one month old, Everett and Easton, still in the NICU. And Sandy Bovard lifts up cousin Randall, back in the hospital with congestive heart failure. Let us pray. Into your care, O Holy One, we entrust all for whom we pray, confident in your abundant and abiding mercy. May they sense your steadfast presence surrounding them and find peace in your care. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Now, now is the time for the kids, so I invite them to come forward so we can spend some time together. Okay, you can sit down here if you want. I mean, <clears throat> we can be closer. How are you doing today? Good. Let me ask you again. How are you doing today? Good. Oh, that, I like that, Garrett. Can you repeat that? Good. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so do you remember what I promised you last Sunday? That we were going to sing all these Sundays during this sermon series, right? Did you bring an instrument? What do you bring? Uh, is that a harmonica? Wonderful, wonderful. Hello, girls. Okay, so what is the natural music instrument that God gave us? We have a couple of them. The first one should be our voice, right? Some of us can sing, others cannot. They believe that they can sing, but they cannot. <laughs> they make noises. But some others can use their hands, right? Clapping. That's another one. Another one? Right? And another one? Right? So we're going to use some of those instruments besides the harmonica. And we're going to sing a song that you probably remember. It says, I have decided to follow Jesus. It says, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Sing it with me? Okay, let's try it. The lyrics is very easy. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. What about we make a bigger choir and we invite these old people here to sing with us, okay? I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning. instruments. Okay? You use your instruments? Okay. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Anybody can tell me what this song is about. Come on. 
what is this song about? Following Jesus, right? We repeat it like four times. <laughs> Following Jesus. And sometimes when we follow Jesus, it's a difficult road. But even though it is a difficult road, the idea is not to turn back. Just to follow Christ and follow his directions. And this is our lesson for today. Look at what um, Jesus told to his disciples one day. And he said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take their cross daily, and follow me. Right? So have you decided to follow Jesus? Have you? Now we're sure, right? <coughs> have you? Yes. Okay, now I invite you to pray together. Okay, let us repeat after me. Dear Jesus, you have called us to follow you. May we answer yes, Lord. I'll follow you. No turning back. No turning back. Amen. Wonderful. Thank you for being with us. And I invite everybody to stand up. As I said, the peace of the Lord be with you. Please share signs of peace to your brothers and sisters. Please remain standing for the reading of the gospel. Hear these words from the gospel of Luke. Once when Jesus was praying alone with only the disciples near him, he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? They answered, John the Baptist, but others, Elijah, and still others, that one of the ancient prophets has risen. Then he said to them, but who do you say that I am. Peter answered, the Messiah of God. He sternly ordered and commanded them not to tell anyone, saying, the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. Then he said to them all, if any wish to come after me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those lo who lose their life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit them if they gain the whole world but lose or forfeit themselves? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words, of them the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes to his glory and the glory of the Father and the holy angels. Indeed, truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated, brothers and sisters. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, today we continue with our sermon series um, on some paradoxes of the Bible. And for these, we continue together reading this book, Paradoxes for Living, Cultivating Faith in Confusing Times. This book that was written by Reverend Dr. Graham Standish um, as a guide for our reflection. Just to let me give you some ads, that advertisement. This Tuesday, we will begin our Bible study of this book. So you are welcome to come. We will get together on Tuesday at 10 a.m. There's enough seats for everybody. So if you want to join us, uh, that would be uh, fantastic. Uh, parts of the book will be provided for you so you can be really um, attuned with these 
uh, Bible study. So let me refresh a little bit uh, our memory in this uh, first uh, sermon that we have last Sunday when we start talking about these paradoxes. And I said that paradoxes is a statement or proposition that seems self-contradictory or absurd, uh, but actually expresses a possible truth. So it's something that sometimes looks like, a, oh, this is difficult to understand. But in, the, in, in it, it has a very interesting and profound truth. So our paradox for today, it says, to save our lives, we have to lose them. Look at what it says. To save our lives, we have to lose them. So how do we understand this paradox? What is Jesus trying to tell us when he pronounced it? Fine, not with these particular words, but the, the main paradox is that. So one of the things that I remember when I was a kid... Yeah, yesterday, yes. <laughs> um, it was that you were able to walk in the streets and see people gathering and talking. And I remember in my time in Uruguay, when I was just walking around and people were outside of the houses drinking their mate or a cup of coffee and just chatting and just talking and just gossiping about what was going on around. But it was just this sense of, we're not in a hurry. We can do things in, in our own time. And just, it was this idea of if time didn't matter or as if weren't things that urge them to move quickly. Paradoxically, today seems to be different. Look at the picture. People are running all day from one place to another one. And as if the world was going to end at any moment. And they didn't have enough time to do everything they planned. Where are you moving your head? Just. Pick the parents. Some of us as parents, some uh, in our present today, we feel very represented by these, what I'm saying. Parents who have their jobs, but they have to run extra miles to take their children to soccer and then to baseball. And then they have to go and do other sports and maybe take them to violin and guitar and other music instruments. And they, they have to comply with the meeting with their boss. Yeah, because they have a job. And they have to be in a celebration that they don't want to be. And they have to be in different places. And their schedule is just a mess of so many stuff. That we feel that we need probably five more hours in a day. But there is still cleaning the house, doing the laundry, cooking, taking the car to the mechanic, and following the daily routine. How many of you feel like that? Come on. Ah. Uh, yes, we feel like that. We feel that we need extra days. We feel that we don't have enough time to do all the stuff that we need to do. And we don't have more energy. I have to tell you, I'm tired. And people say, but how can you be tired, Pastor Miguel, if you just work on Sundays? <laughs> but I'm tired. And I'm sure that you are tired too, and we are not even in the middle of the year. That's the reason why I took a smoothie this morning, full of protein. 
so I can jump today in the sermon. But there's not enough hours in the day to do everything we need to do or we want to do. And I know a person who is always late, always late. And I, asked, and I asked her one day, why does that happen? And she told me, I feel that I have many things to do. And when I am ready to go somewhere, there are thousands of other things that need my attention before leaving. How many of you feel like that? Don't you feel something similar in your life? How come the hours of the day are short and we need, as I said, extra hours? And why do we kill ourselves in this way? Why do we feel that we have to do so many stuff during the day? And the answer, brothers and sisters, can vary. From the need to satisfy the needs of our families, the economic needs and the desire for a different life or simple the feeling of to occupy our time in the best way as possible. Maybe you have heard this old saying that says, we live to work and not work to live. Let me repeat it. We live to work and not work to leave. So balancing work and personal life can be very challenging. And I'm talking to experts, right? We are experts on that. We try to balance our lives here and we feel sometimes that we are in a circus like a juggler. <laughs> yeah, right? And it's a difficult thing. It's a difficult thing. But the truth is that many times we feel pressure to be seen as competent, effective, and sometimes superior in our abilities. I have to be a good worker. I have to be a good spouse. I have to be a good parent. I have to be a good friend. I have to be a good church member and much more. However, it is very likely that after a while of an active rhythm like this, we will completely, give me the word, burn out. Burn out. And you cannot tell me that you haven't been burned out. Because we have been burned out many times, and I have been burned out many times. But we don't want to admit it. Because according to us, it is necessary to continue. We must comply with the schedule, with others, and with God. And because God doesn't bother us much, so probably with God we don't even think about it. We don't feel the pressure of a boss or somebody who is just pressing us there. And deep down, what is there to fulfill? Why do we feel like we have to do so much until we die physically, we die mentally, we die spiritually? It's like we believe that by making all these superhuman, I'm doing like a superman, right? Let me do it this way a little bit. Superhuman, superhuman things will be better. But what about our well-being? You know what? I feel that I'm preaching to myself. What about our well-being? Where does feed in our scale of priorities? So in this book, Dr. Standish uh, tells us that that the answer is found in one word, according to him, and that word is salvation. And I'm going to read what he says. This is not my words. This is what he wrote. I'm quoting. He says, at a deep level, 
we are all trying to work out our salvation. We may not see it that way, but that is what we're doing. We are not only trying to find meaning in our lives, we are also trying to accomplish, achieve, and attain things in life that give us a sense of immortality and permanence. We hope that we can gain a sense of immortality through our achievements at work, as parents, and in our communities. Close the quotation. So in other words, we are very function-oriented people. We think that our accomplishments and achievements are the things that will save us at the end. And the truth is that Jesus never said that the key to salvation comes through doing more. This is not about the amount of things we do to gain acceptance from our children, from our spouses, from the congregation, from the pastor, and from God. Instead, Jesus asked a question. And the question is, what does it profit them if they gain the whole world but lose or forfeit? themselves. So the paradox here is that Jesus calls us to lose our lives so that they may be saved. So in essence, Jesus tells us that the answer to all our desires, the answer to all our ambitions, the answer to our personal projects is not necessarily obtaining through the number of things we do. What Jesus is telling us is that when we choose to have faith and when we have placed God at the center of our lives, we will often encounter opposition. And what does it mean to lose our lives for Christ? At a fundamental and radical level, it means... Willingly following Christ to every place God leads. And let me tell you, that's hard. Because sometimes we feel that in this hour and something, sometimes 45 minutes, depending on the pastor, how long the sermon is. Um, we feel that this is our time with God. So then we just go out from church and we forget I mean we have seven more days to do whatever we have to do and then maybe in our time we have an hour for a Bible study don't forget Bible study Tuesday 10 and maybe we have time for another activity oh helping hands so let us helping helping hands and maybe we have time to do something else but our lives we forget that God is constantly with us and one of the things that we are called to do is to have God to lead us during the daily life. We are to let go of our ambitions and desires so that they no longer have the power to dominate our lives. A life for God means eternity. Perennial union with him. And for this reason, Jesus invites us to reflect on the meaning that we give to life. And most of the time, a merely biological meaning. A life that begins at birth and ends with death. But is that real life? Is that real, really life? When God is involved, brothers and sisters, in our lives, he takes an active role. And God does not just give us ideas and then leave us on our own to work them through. God takes part 
by creating opportunities, by bringing people together, by creating a small and large miracles and ensuring that circumstances keep working in our favor. So Jesus' promise is a reward that nothing and no one can take away from us. And when Jesus says, he who loses his life for me, it does not include only the martyrs of the church that have existed in our church through history, but also all those women and men of good will who offer their work and their daily fatigue to God. Are you one of them? Are you one of them? Friend, are you willing to lose your life for Christ? Are you willing to let God take your life? Look at the word that I'm using, take your life. To indeed lose our lives for Christ's sake. Then it is essential that we begin by saying to God, take my life. And next, we need to create a space in our hearts and in our minds for the Holy Spirit to enter and move and guide us. And finally, we need to allow, allow Christ to be incarnated within us so that we look to God's guidance, love, and grace in everything. So we won't have the problem of just being an hour with God because this is what society tells us. It's because we feel that God is every single moment permeating our lives and is there in our decisions, even in the most simple ones. And this is how we lose our lives to save them. May the Lord guide your life in this time of personal reflection. By saying to God, as this beautiful hymn says, take my life and let it be. Consecrated, Lord, to thee.
let us prepare our spirits to pray. God of all, you call your disciples by the Sea of Galilee to follow you. And you continue calling us now to be your disciples by leaving everything and following you. How many times do we believe that we can manage to follow you simply by making the minimum effort? But all we get is complacency. Teach us to take up our crosses and follow you. To follow you, leaving everything behind with faith and courage. To follow you with love, the one that does not abandon us, but accompanies us on the way. To follow you with commitment, even if the road appears discouraging and exhausting. To follow you with joy, even when the busyness of the day many times takes away the enjoyment of life. To follow you because the promise is that whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. May our prayer today be a prayer of our faithfulness to you. In which each one of us decides to follow you without turning back. By taking up our cross in love. Let's follow the path of your disciples. Those who left their nets, jobs, families and towns. And look up their own crosses. Those disciples who learned to feel daily company in prayer. By saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. There is no better demonstration of our faith than how we share our resources with others. Offering our tithes and gifts shows our commitment to help those in need, and it shows that we trust in God to provide for our own needs. So let us now make our offerings with cheerful hearts that we may become a partner with Christ bringing compassion, mercy, and justice to those in need.
together in the prayer of dedication. Good and gracious God, accept these we bring to you now as a sign and symbol of our thanksgiving. Bless these gifts and those that offer them, that together we may do good things in your name. Amen. As we prepare to leave this place and go forth to serve God, I invite you to join me in a time of surrender and commitment. God calls us to devote our lives to live as disciples in the world today. calls us to go where we are needed so that we may serve those who are in need. calls us to tell others that they are worthy, cherished, and loved by God. God calls us to be selfless so that we grow in our awareness of, of how we are called to be one in Christ. calls us to give up our lives, not that we will die, but that we will live more fully as a disciple in the world today. Let us surrender our lives and respond to God's call. Take my love. and sisters in Christ, may you continue to follow Jesus by taking your cross with faithfulness. That every moment that you live this week be time to confirm your commitment to Jesus. As I bless you, do you bless me. So go and proclaim the resurrected Christ in the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you all.